Hi, and welcome to this introduction to complexity or how a social system or an economic system is also complex. So we'll try to get a sense of what that means. So I'll be introducing the concept and, and of, of complexity and, and, and showing you some complex systems in this video while we then in the live session, you will have the opportunity to play around with a new educational tool that has been developed just for this particular purpose in this particular course where you'll try to get a sense of what is a complex economic system, what happens if I change different features of it, and, and why is a economic system then actually complex. Um, so we'll get to that in the, in the live session, and then afterwards I'll do another follow-up video trying to sort of link it all together, um, and of course also in the live session uh, answer all the questions that you might have. Okay, but let's get to it, what we mean when I say complexity or complex. It's very important to emphasize that I don't just mean complicated. Things can be really complicated instead of easy or simple because they're just very, very difficult to figure out. It's difficult to figure out um, what, where Jupiter, the planet, will be three months from now or other sort of similar challenges. This is very, very difficult, but it's still predictable. Um, it's like looking at the, I don't know, tens of thousands of pieces that a plane is made out of, it's still, if you're an expert predictable, you can put them all together and you can predict whether this plane is going to fly or not. The sum is the same as sort of, the, the sum is equal to all the parts. While in a complex system, um, you can't just look at all the elements, you can't just look at all the components of a complex system and then say, ah, this is going to do this. You can look at all the neurons in the brain and still be amazed by the fact that it works the way that it does. Um, and I'll get, show you quite a few examples of, of, of systems where stuff happens that you wouldn't have expected just by looking at the individual components. So really the key perspective here is that you can't just understand a complex system by looking at each component individually. You have to put them together. You have to see how they respond and interact with each other um, in order to see where we end up at. That's a very abstract definition uh, and an explanation, and it will make a lot more sense, I think, when you see some of the examples that I'll try to point out. So, and again, there are lots of definition and angles on complexity. Um, the key perspective I wanna highlight here, um, and which is sort of also very much in line with the curriculum, is to say that a complex system is sort of a characteriz characterization of the behavior with the emerging behavior, so what the system in the end does, seems to be more than just a simple sum of its parts. And again, <clears throat> when you see the examples in a bit, this will make more sum, uh, sense to you. But I also acknowledge that the many different definitions do exist. And the key element here is that a traditional assumption is, I think, that if you want to create something complex, um, then you need to coordinate it. There has to be a leader, whether it's a manager or a CEO or just any kind of person, intelligent animal, whatever we could think of, it has to be someone who organizes and coordinates it in order to create this sort of intelligent behavior. And that's what I'll then show in some of the following examples that, has, that it's turned out, that's what research has uncovered in the last few decades, that this is just not quite right. You can see what we call complex behavior in systems where each element is incredibly simple and you could almost sort of in some sense call them each element is, is quite stupid. So let's, 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 I think it's best if I just show you what I have in mind here. So let's see a little bit of a video by someone called Trogatz who, um, who talks about complex systems. Sorry about that. synchrony in nature, which is the, um, the glorious example of uh, birds that flock together or, or fish swimming in organized schools. So um, these are not particularly intelligent creatures, and yet, as we'll see, they, they exhibit beautiful ballets. This is from a BBC show called Predators, and what we're looking at here are examples of synchrony that have to do with defense. When you're small and vulnerable, like these starlings, or like the fish, it helps to swarm to avoid predators, to confuse predators. Let me just be quiet for a second because it's so gorgeous. For a long time, biology 
biologists were puzzled by this behavior, wondering how it could be possible. We're so used to choreography giving rise to synchrony. These creatures are not choreographed. They're choreographing themselves. And only today is science starting to figure out how it works. Here's a, I'll show you a computer model made by Ian Kuzan, a, a researcher at Oxford, that shows how swarms work. There are just three simple rules. First, all the individuals are only aware of their nearest neighbors. Second, all the individuals have a tendency to line up. And third, they're all attracted to each other, but they try to keep a small distance apart. And when you build those three rules in, automatically you start to see swarms that look very much like fish schools or, or bird flocks. Now fish like to stay close together, about a body length apart. Birds try to stay about three or four body lengths apart, but except for that difference, the rules are the same for both. Now all this changes when a predator enters the scene. There's a fourth rule. When a predator's coming, get out of the way. Here on the model, you see the predator attacking. The prey move out in random directions, and then the rule of attraction brings them back together again. So there's this constant splitting and reforming. And you see that in nature. Keep in mind that although it looks as if uh, each individual is acting to cooperate, what's really going on is a kind of selfish Darwinian behavior. Each is scattering away at random to try to save its scales or feathers. That is, out of the, the desire to save itself, each creature is following these rules and that leads to something that's safe for all of them, even though it looks like they're thinking as a group. They're not. So, as explained here by Stephen Strogatz in the video, we have a range of different kinds of animals, fish, grasshoppers, birds, quite a few others, that are fairly simple in the sense that if you look at them individually, um, it does not seem to be the case that they would be able to coordinate this very sort of synchronized, um, almost intelligent behavior. Because what they do is just to pay attention to the neighbors, they um, have a tendency to line up and they're attracted to each other in terms of, of distance. And then, as, as he said, the fourth rule of running from, pred from predators. But since all these animals follow the same three simple rules, together it looks like a very coordinated system that is quite um, sort of efficient in moving around in, in the world and also in terms of running away from, from predators. So this this shows something about sort of the key element of complexity that the behavior of a full system like a school of uh, fish or a flock of birds is that the behavior of the whole system seems to be more than individual parts. If all researchers could only look at one fish or one bird at a time, it would have been difficult to predict their ability to coordinate to the extreme degree that they're able to. So this is sort of a key element of, of, of also the definition and the angle on complexity that I mentioned just before, that there is something more going on on the system level than you could decipher just from looking at the each individual isolators. I'm going to show that in another um, simulation. He already showed a simulation model before. I think he also mentioned ants. So I'm going to show in a bit a simulation. That means that, that all of these different things you are seeing here on the screen are ants, and then they also follow simple rules, just as we heard before. And what we'll again see in just a second is that this full collection of ants, individually, they don't have a plan. They don't know what it means to go out in that direction and find some food and go back and tell your friends about it. They don't have that kind of intelligence. But at an overall system level, their behavior is quite coordinated and solves a very difficult problem of finding all food in the area uh, in a quickly and an efficient way. Um, so again, another example where each individual element is not capable of intelligent, coordinated behavior, but at a system level, because the sum is more than each of its parts, 
then it works out. So this is the simulation model of ant behavior that I was referring to just before and from the link in the PowerPoint slide. So let me just run it just once so you can sort of get a sense of it. So this is the ant nest in the middle, all the red little thingies are ant running around. And, and these circles are then um, food um, posts. So this is where they can collect food from. And you'll then see some, some sort of greenish stuff. And that's the chemical trail that ants leave behind. So when they found food and they return back to their home, they will leave behind a chemical trail that others can, can follow. What you see is here, and I hope you get a, a sense of, is that the ants are just sort of running around at random. They don't have a direction. They're not able to say, ah, food is over there. Let me go 100 meters straight and then turn right. They can run around at random um, and they can follow the chemical trail that those ants that happen to stumble upon food find. So let's just watch it again. This is not intelligent behavior as such by each individual ant. Just by looking at one ant and what they can do, one would not necessarily be able to realize that this is a very efficient, complex behavior by this ant system. They are able to communicate to others that there's food here and that everyone else should go there. At least everyone, I mean, in the sense that if another ant stumble upon this chemical trail, they will know to follow it. I can also show you that this can sort of look differently. Imagine that this is how the chemical trail worked. It would be really narrow and it would evaporate, so disappear very quickly. Then the ant behavior would not be very efficient. Of course, they in the end would find food, but it would take a very long time. But evolutionary speaking, ants have just sort of found the right mixture between uh, of how quickly this, this chemical trail should should evaporate. So, so again, the aim is here, <coughs> sorry, the aim is here to show that the sum is more than the individual parts. If we just looked at one individual ant, we would say they are not able to communicate uh, to others. They would not be that efficient in finding all the food in the area. But when we look at the collective and when we see the feedback that sort of goes back and forth between ants and the way they can leave behind chemical trails after finding food, we suddenly have a system where they quite quickly can find all the food in the area. Um, even though that the individual ant is not intelligent, um, the overall system is actually showing what we then could call complex behavior. So overall, we've now seen how com complex system level behavior can emerge in, 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 in these situations with animals where we think sort of each individual animal by itself, a fish or an ant or a bird, are not should not be able to coordinate into such uh, effective system level behavior where ants are very quickly able to sort of spot the food locations and and and, um, and get to them quickly um, the point that i want to make now is we can actually imagine an even simpler setup let's imagine a setup where we're looking at a screen of black or white cells and these black or white cells then interact based on given rules that a video is going to explain in just a second. So, I mean, there is nothing alive in here. It's just alive in sort of the intelligent, sentient sense. It's, it's just a cell can either be black or white, and the color it has will depend on the colors of its neighbors. It sounds pretty simple, sim pretty boring. Nothing interesting could emerge out of that, right? Rhetorical question, you'll see that in just a second. So let's watch this just a couple of minutes from this, from this video. Um, on this game of life. So you'll be watching a, a setup where there will be a bunch of cells on the screen and these cells will be either black or white, meaning alive or dead. And the color they have will then depend on the color of the neighbors, as will be explained in just a second in, in the video here. So every cell has eight neighbors, horizontally, vertically, and diagonally. And what color it has in each step, whether it's alive or dead, will then depend on the colors of the neighbors. And here you then see four rules, very, very simple. Just the number of neighbors of a certain color influences the color of the given cell in the next round. You don't need to understand the particular rules, just this is all there is to it in this system. Very, very basic, very simple. Just specifying whether a cell will be black or white. But let's see what happens 
when we then actually make some cells either black or white in the starting formation and then sort of push go. So they move because the, in the, every new situation, new cells are black or white, and that influences the neighboring and the neighbor and the neighbor, etc. And this then creates these quite dynamic uh, setups. And this goes on for quite a while, and as you can see, this becomes really, really synchronized on a very, very large and impressive level. Again, all of this is emerging from the four simple rules that we heard, um, and then different kinds of starting formation. Depending on the starting formation, you get different endpoints. And this goes on. I'll just be jumping to a couple of places in the video. Okay, that was enough loud music for now. I think, as you can see, it was not easy to predict, first of all, that anything interesting would happen based on these rules, but certainly not these kinds of very synchronized and, and even beautiful um, um, behaviors will emerge out of it. And this is just about playing around with different starting positions. So you might be able to imagine how much time various people around the world have spent on trying out different starting positions because it's really very much of a trial and error kind of thing. So even in a setting where there's just absolutely no any kind of intelligent behavior, however we define it, just be because these cells interact with each other and sort of provide feedback to each other, then dynamics occur. And that's really the main point that we want to make here. So complexity is something else than just being complicated. Because of this constant feedback, and then every element in the system can in the end influence other elements. And we see this sort of complex, sophisticated systems don't need a coordination by a leader. It can emerge sort of from, from simple rules and, and simple parts. The sum is more than the individual parts combined. And it also becomes a different perspective than what we see in classical economics. The starting point doesn't really matter for supply demand mechanism to work. I mean, if someone starts out charging way too high a price, well, in the end, they get to the equilib equilibrium. That's the whole point of the supply demand function that we have. Here in a complex system and the way that we understand it here, the starting point and the specific interactions that people are following actually really matters for the endpoint. So it's a fundamentally different sort of attempt of trying to understand these economic systems. And this is also what I want to get to, but I do want to show one more video on animals that can sort of further illustrate and make this point. It's about wolves in Yellowstone. And uh, let's watch a couple of minutes on how sort of all of these different animals and plants and nature in general uh, influences the behavior of other animals and plants, etc. In, in Yellowstone. And I'll sort of link back to afterwards how that relates to human economic systems. One of the most exciting scientific findings of the past half century has been the discovery of widespread trophic cascades. A trophic cascade is an ecological process which starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles all the way down to the bottom. And the classic example is what happened in the Yellowstone National Park in the United States when wolves were reintroduced in 1995. Now, we, we all know that wolves kill various species of animals, but perhaps we're slightly less aware that they give life to many others. Before the wolves turned up, they'd been absent for 70 years. 
that the numbers of deer, because there was nothing to hunt them, had built up and built up in the Yellowstone Park, and despite efforts by humans to control them, they'd managed to reduce much of the vegetation there to almost nothing. They'd just grazed it away. But as soon as the wolves arrived, even though they were few in number, they started to have the most remarkable effects. First, of course, they killed some of the deer, but that wasn't the major thing. Much more significantly, they radically changed the behaviour of the deer. The deer started avoiding certain parts of the park, the places where they could be trapped most easily, particularly the valleys and the gorges. And immediately, those places started to regenerate. In some areas, the height of the trees quintupled in just six years. Bare valley sides quickly became forests of aspen and willow and cottonwood. And as soon as that happened, the birds started moving in. The number of songbirds and migratory birds started to increase greatly. The number of beavers started to increase because beavers like to, to eat the trees. And beavers, like wolves, are ecosystem engineers. They create niches for other species. And the dams they built in the rivers uh, provided habitats for otters and muskrats and ducks and fish and reptiles and amphibians. The wolves killed coyotes and as a result of that the number of rabbits and mice began to rise which meant more hawks, more weasels, more foxes, more badgers. Ravens and bald eagles came down to feed on the carrion that the wolves had left. Bears fed in it too, and their population began to rise as well, partly also because there were more berries growing on the regenerating shrubs. And the bears reinforced the impact of the wolves by killing some of the calves of the deer. But here's where it gets really interesting. The wolves changed the behaviour of the rivers. They began to meander less. There was less erosion, the channels narrowed, more pools formed, more riffle sections, all of which were great for wildlife habitats, the rivers changed in response to the wolves. And the reason was that the regenerating forests stabilised the banks so that they collapsed less often, so that the rivers became more fixed in their course. Similarly, by driving the deer out of some places and the vegetation recovering on the valley sides, there was a soil erosion because the vegetation stabilised that as well. So the wolves, small in number, transformed not just the ecosystem of the Yellowstone National Park, this huge area of land, but also its physical geography. You can, if you want to, briefly pause the video and reflect on this question, why do we watch a video about wolves in Yellowstone? It's about people and economic systems. But I think, it, and I'll, I'll make the point clear here in the following slides, I think it's uh, quite useful to make sense of this complexity perspective. What is a complex system? So if we wanted to do build sort of a classical regression analysis of a thousand Yellowstone parks and then see what happens, and in principle, we could try to run that analysis. But the complexity point is that you would not really understand all the different sort of feedback mechanisms and how all each individual animal influences other animals and what is actually sort of dynamically going on within the system just by looking at some 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 plots on, on a graph. And it also would be struggle to capture that the particular starting formation and the exact way that animals interact and all the various random uh, behavior that emerges how that matters. That's exactly what we saw in the game of life and with, the, with some of the animal videos before, that particular rules of, of how uh, these entities interact and the particular starting formation can greatly influence. So it's not just about how many wolves there are, it's also about where they're being put out into the Yellowstone and where the deers originally were. And this is sort of the features of the complexity angle is trying to... Let's go to a human example that, that's something that Duncan Watts at one point made. So Duncan Watts, he made a bunch of people listen to music that they didn't know beforehand, these 84, um, 48, sorry, recordings. And he then had various experimental groups. So sometimes uh, the, the people in the experiment could sort of see how often the sound, song had been downloaded and sometimes they could only see the average rating. And, and sometimes even reversed, so what they thought was the best song was actually the worst song. 
Um, so he tried out these sort of various experimental conditions in this controlled environment, uh, trying to make sure that these were recordings by little known indie bands, so people in the experiment did not know these beforehand. The most striking finding, you can sort of go to the New York Times article if you want to, to see the sort of more full description. The most striking finding was that the starting point, so, so people could see how often a song had been downloaded the average rating. So let's say I enter the system as number four person. Whatever the three first person did, whether they liked a song or did not like a song, had a really strong impact on sort of the, the final outcome of this particular song. If a few early listeners happened to like it, then the song would go on to succeed. So there isn't really an average quality to a song. What there is is sort of some element of the quality, but what randomly happens very early on, let's say a song is bound to, on average, to, to in, sort of in, in some kind of average setting, getting 50 likes or 50 good ratings. Depending on how early it gets them, it will actually end up getting a lot more likes. Um, so, and again, a simple linear regression can't really capture these dynamic feedback effects that I am influenced by what someone else thinks and whatever I do is influencing what others are thinking and what all these others are thinking might then influence me again in the future of, of how much I actually like to get song. So, this feedback that was produced sharply influenced how a song was rated and how often it was downloaded. Most popular songs sort of ended up um, sort of ended up also being popular. So there was sort of an underlying quality to it, but you could sort of easily end up number 10 out of the 48 songs or number 42, depending on what happened very early on. So again, this sort of complexity angle on the feedback mechanisms within the system influencing what happens over time. And this then also goes to the a key quote here that it's hard to understand why even a single, so let's, but now we're going to a broad organizational human angle here. The, the whole point is here that if we want to understand what's going on, we need to not only understand the individuals in an organization, not only understand that organizations compete with others, but there is a lot of other things that can influence the individual and the organization. And as he's saying here, the interaction between all of these components. So this is what happens in Yellowstone. We can't just say, well, I want to understand the wolves. Well, you need to understand how the wolves influences the deers, which influences the plants, which might influence the bears, which then again might influence the wolf behavior. You need to take all these interactions into account. But the thing in, 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 in economic studies, we usually sort of look at one angle at a time. We would look at, well, what if we pay individuals more? What happens? Sure, they might sort of change their effort, but it might also mean they suddenly get different kinds of employees or something happens in other organizations, they also have to pay their employees more. And then suddenly the general expected level is higher and then it might harm or help the competitive uh, sort of force in the environment. Um, we, the point here is that if we want to sort of understand what is going on in an economic system, we should not look at each component in itself. We should look at all the different components and we should look at how they are interacting because it is going to matter. That's what the Yellowstone video saw or showed. And that's what we can for also, for instance, use the Dan O'Reilly meaningfulness study to illustrate. Dan O'Reilly was explicitly trying to only look at isolated individuals in order to really control the environment. But if we really want to understand meaningfulness, well, what about interaction with other individuals? I mean, people in workplaces, they don't work alone. They actually see what others are doing and respond to what others are doing. How about the management style? Might that also influence or the organizational culture in a given organization? And what, what competitors do? Will that also influence something? Um, what if they implement a similar system? Will the labor supply change? How about national culture, financial crisis, et cetera, et cetera? Duncan Watts is here arguing that if you really want to understand the importance of meaningfulness for work or the importance of pay rises or whatever we could be interested in, we need to take all these different components that interact into account because whatever happens at one level can influence what happens at another level. Just as whatever happens with the rivers will influence um, other animals or whatever one ant does can influence what another ant is doing. So we need to get these sort of feedback mechanisms. We need to understand them. We need to understand the interactions between people because they will matter. 
this is the, the point from the complexity angle, which doesn't sort of quite square with the classical economics perspective. I'm going to talk more about that in, in a later video. So in that sense, Duncan Watts is like really challenging the fundamental and existing paradigm of how we should study business, how we should study and make sense of organizations. Um, he's saying it's fine to do a sort of isolated experiment, but as the music study showed, if we only make people listen to music by themselves, so all participants were just listening to their own music without seeing what others were thinking, we would get very different results than we get in this interactive system. And this is then also what we will be, this is also what we will be focusing on and working with in the live session. So, as I said in the beginning, uh, um, my colleague Arthur Yort has developed an educational tool that can help us make sense of economic and social and health systems. So we're going to be using the COVID crisis to try to illustrate this. And, and, and this is sort of a screenshot we see here to the bottom right here that we'll be playing around with in the live session. You'll get access to a link where you can, um, uh, we, can we can sort of play with it. And in order to understand what it means for a model and for a simulation model to try to track and understand human behavior and how it matters whether we change something at individual level or family level or village level or government level, all these things interact and, 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 and how the feedback mechanisms are specified really matters. This sounds quite abstract, I realize, but you'll get an, a sense of it when we play around with the, the game setup. Again, I can go back to, I think the Dan O'Reilly study really illustrates it the most clearly that what we often do is to focus on one isolated component at a time. Complexity angle is emphasizing, look, if we did that with animal, we will actually be misunderstanding quite a lot. Same thing applies to human beings. We need to understand how all these different levels that interact if we're gonna wanna get a full understanding of the complex system that is human economic behavior. And I'll be talking more about that in a future video. First, the educational tool in the live session.